Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time this morning to attend. I'm Mike Regan. I'm the Midwest Account Manager for the NEC SL product. And I'd like to welcome you to our, our little introduction to voice over IP and the SL2100, uh, something that I, called embra I call embrace the technology. Uh, and we're going to talk in terms of uh, today with voice over IP in terms of theory and how uh, uh, voice over IP um, integrates in with the system and how you can use the, the voice over IP capabilities of the system to enhance your sales or to help enhance your sales. I'm not going to get into programming of voice over IP. I believe Gordon Chamberlain does a, a, a WebEx where he talks about programming phones and things like that. So today is more so of a concept and an introduction to the voice over IP capabilities of the system. All right. Before we get started, uh, this is kind of an old slide, but I still like to reiterate it. Um, as if we have anybody familiar with the SL1100, uh, we're done with that. End of new sales uh, announcement went out to uh, distribution earlier this year, and we're kind of, uh, in terms of the SL1100 packages, we're in a kind of a wall supplies last scenario, which means everything that we had left on the SL1100 packages is out in distribution. Um, so any new system sales should be the SL2100. Remember the SL2100, even though we're talking about voice over IP today, it can still be used as a basic key telephone system. It's expandable with up to two additional cabinets. Each cabinet can be configured for 12 lines, 24 stations. Right? And we do have price competitive packages, but for the purposes of today's presentation, I want to remind everybody that the SL2100 is a hybrid solution. So it can be a digital key telephone system, it can be a voice over IP system, be a combination of the two, and it's all done with the same cabinet. All right? One of the reasons that, or one of the things that we're starting to warn people about is by 2020, uh, AT&T is looking to, or I should say the phone company, is looking to eliminate POTS lines. Now, does that mean by this time next year you won't be able to buy a POTS line? No, absolutely not. What it does mean is that POTS will probably become the premium way of delivering the telecommunications signal to the DMARC, right? So um, SIP trunks and PRI circuits are, are going to be the primary way uh, of delivering signal, uh, especially SIP trunks. That's going to be the most, eventually become the most economical way to do that. So and that's another reason why it helps to become a little more fluent in, in voice over IP, all right? So let's say we want to start selling voice over IP or your customer wants a voice over IP solution. Um, when, when encountering this, I go back uh, to like my fifth grade social studies class when we talked about journalism and, you know, you have the five questions of journalism. Well, I took three of those questions. Your customer wants voice over IP. What, why, and how are the three questions I like to ask regarding voice over IP, All right? And we can start with the what. What is your customer's interpretation of voice over IP? Voice over IP is this giant elephant in the room that could take on several different formations when talk about when talking about voice over IP. So are they looking for just bringing to bring in SIP trunks? Are they talking about communications as a service, which is usually hosted, you know, or voice as a service, software as a service, unified communications as a service, and there's so many more with this X equals as a service. All right? Are they talking strictly off-premise extension? Are they looking to network devices together or network systems together? Are they talking about bringing their own device? 
Do they mean, like I said, SIP trunks, or they're bringing in an MPLS network, which back in the day used to be uh, primarily for the enterprise. Now we're seeing MPLS in the small business, right? You know, are they a network operating center? You know, what do they mean by voice over IP? Voice over IP can take on, you know, several different meanings to different people. So we need to drill down and ask, you know, what or, or figure out what type of voice over IP. And it starts with, you know, why. Why they feel they need voice over IP. Um, and when you ask end users why they feel the need for voice over IP, you get a, ver a, a, a varied amount of answers. Or, or the, the answers you get to that question are, are quite different, quite varied, and a lot of times wrong. Um, so I, I want to address some of the voice over IP misconceptions here. First one is it's the latest and greatest technology. It is the latest technology. Um, the greatest, that kind of depends on the network that you're connecting to. You And you will see this be a recurring theme throughout this presentation. Um, successful voice over IP deployment is not necessarily contingent upon the telecommunications equipment you're using, although all of us manufacturers would like to tell you that we're the best. But the great, the, 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 the more important factor to a successful voice over IP deployment is the network that you're, you're hooking the system up to. If the network is substandard, well, guess what? You can have the voice, voice over, you can have the best voice over IP solution out there connected. And if it's connected to a terrible network, you're going to get terrible voice over IP performance. All right. Another one of my favorites is it's just plug and play. You just plug into an existing network and off and running, you go. You're making phone calls. And that's not necessarily the case. There is programming involved. You know, your phones now become network devices, so they all have to be addressed. Uh, you know, have network addresses to them, and they, they have to be programmed that way. Uh, now, it's true once the system is all set up, you can unplug a, a, a voice over IP phone from one network port and plug it into another one, and, and everything comes up working, all right? Free long distance, um, nothing is free. <laughs> Even SIP trunk service providers will will charge for long distance. Uh, they will charge a higher rate for long distance. It's not great. I mean, it's not a huge amount, but they do charge for long distance. Uh, another one is, is voicemail to email. Um, this is actually a really great feature, um, but it is not a voice over IP feature. We've been doing uh, voicemail to email or vo email integration um, on our TDM solutions for about the last 12 years. Um, it's a network application. It is not necessarily a voice over IP application. And it's the same with CTI, computer telephony integration. Again, not necessarily a network application, or I'm sorry, not necessarily a voice over IP application. It's more of a networking application. You can do CTI applications on a digital key telephone system, all right? So both the, the voice or the, the email integration and the CTI applications, those are both networking applications. People assume they're voice over IP applications because your, your competitors out there touting hosted um, are touting these features. So everybody thinks, you know, by default that, you know, email integration and computer telephony integration are voice over IP applications and they're not, all right? And the primary reason that, you know, people uh, uh, go or, or say they need voice over IP is it's usually because the previous company that was in quoting a system told them they need voice over IP 
without taking into consideration some of these other factors that we've already talked about. All right, again, the biggest one being network, the network that you're hooking up to. But the biggest misconception of them all when in terms of voice over IP is that voice over IP is an either or proposition. You either have a voice over IP solution or you have a digital key telephone solution. Um, or as a lot of people mistakenly refer to it as an analog telephone system. You either have one or the other, and that is not the case. That's the cool part about the SL2100 is that you can run it as a hybrid solution. You can have digital key telephones on it. You can have voice over IP telephones on it. You can bring in pass lines. You can bring in SIP trunks, and you can have them all run together uh, simultaneously, all right? So voice over IP is not an either or proposition. So you can tailor the voice over IP features on the system based on your customer's needs and how they're going to use the system. And that comes up, comes up to the next question of how. How are they going to use the system? And that involves things like, will they have remote users? Teleworkers, right? That's the, the new millennial term, teleworkers. Back in the old days, uh, you know, in the 90s, we used to call them off-premise extensions, okay? Will they have workers with multiple workstations? A, a good example of this is a school where a teacher may work in, uh, in one or two or maybe even three different classrooms throughout the day. All right, with a voice over IP, he or she can unplug the phone from their one classroom, go plug it into the next classroom, and all of their information comes up. Because with voice over IP, programming stays with the device. Whereas in a TDM solution or a digital key telephone, programming stays with a port. All right, will they be using soft phones, third party soft phones? Um, will they be using smartphones? or tablets to integrate with their communication uh, system, All right? That's another question. And that can lend itself to some voice over IP applications. SIP trunks, as we talked earlier, SIP trunks is become, gonna become more and more of a factor when you're out there selling phone systems because that's gonna be the primary way of delivering signal to the DMARC and we can handle SIP trunks on the 2100. Will they be networking locations together? All right, do they have two or three locations within a region that they wanna to network together so they could transfer calls across the network and make intercom calling across the network, things like that, okay? And one that I've kind of highlighted and italicized because people don't realize this is with voice over IP on the SL2100, you can add more phones without necessarily needing to add more cabinets. Okay, remember I showed you in that earlier slide, if you use the system as a digital key telephone system, you're basically looking at 12 by 24, 12 lines, 24 stations, that's with POP lines. All right, and then if you wanted to add, you know, more digital stations beyond the 24, you would have to add another cabinet and the appropriate cards, All right? With the SL2100, and, and I have slides showing this in, in, in the upcoming, you can add up to 112 IP stations and do it all in one cabinet, all right? So sometimes if, if, if somebody is growing a system and maybe they don't have closet space for additional cabinets or and their network can support voice over IP, it may make more sense to add those phones via voice over IP than it would just to add a bunch of more digital phones. All right, so that's something you have to look at and including cost factor because sometimes it's more cost efficient 
to add voice over IP phones to the system than it is adding digital phones when you take into account the cost of the additional cabinet and the cards needed to do that. All right. Business communication systems sells, installs, and uh, uh, services. Now I got to figure out who that. Is. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so that's uh, you know. So you have to figure out, how, or you need to figure out how they're going to utilize the system. And based off of that, I came up with some primary reasons for doing voice over IP, remote users, off-premise extensions. DIDs without using a PRI circuit. Maybe a small business wants to do DIDs. They can't do it with POTS lines, and maybe they're too small to do a, D, uh, a PRI circuit and, and utilize all 23 channels. Maybe they only have four or five, six lines. Well, with four or five, six SIP trunks, you can do DIDs off of those. Moving extensions to a different workstation. I, ta I used the school as an example of that. Networking systems together. We kind of talked about that. All right, recurring monthly revenue. This is a, an area we haven't talked about. Recurring monthly revenue. SIP trunk service providers are offering um, uh, monthly spiffs and, and, and residuals based on how many numbers you guys turn on for that provider. So this would be a nice way to enhance, uh, this, this concept of reoccurring monthly revenue is kind of a nice way to enhance um, your business and kind of add found money to your bottom line. But you would have to talk to, to your different SIP, you know, different SIP service providers to see who will offer you the best deal. Right. And then, as I mentioned, growing an SL2100, sometimes it'll make more sense to do that via voice over IP than it would to do just to add additional cabinets and digital, uh, uh, you know, digital stations. So you have to look at, at, at the cost efficiency of doing both. All right. So some considerations when doing voice over IP. First one is reliability. Voice over IP is only going to be as good as the network that it resides upon, right? If, if they have a kind of a spit and wax paper network, you're going to get spit and wax paper performance on, uh, from their voice over IP. And, and, you know, a lot of, you have to be careful with your end users because a lot of them will tell you, hey, my network is, is great, no problem, you can, attach the system to the network and everything will be great. And when you do, everything is not great. Um, because there's things like bandwidth consideration that needs to be taken. The, the bandwidth usage for voice over IP is way different than the bandwidth requirements for a simple data network. So a lot of times when you put a voice over IP solution on a simple data network um, or, or a network that where they're going to do both voice and data and it's a simple network, you're going to run into issues. So a couple things people do is that they'll put a voice over IP solution in and build a separate network for it. Or the end user may need to upgrade their network infrastructure. So because of that, startup may be as much, if not more, than uh, 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 a TDM solution. Look, the cost difference between a, a digital key telephone system and a voice over IP system is not that great. The cost may be in upgrading the network. So you have to take a look at the network infrastructure. How robust is it? What, what bandwidth is their network supporting? Do they have QoS routers or quality of service routers on the system? Do they have managed switches? Do you need, you need one or both to, to assign uh, IP addresses to the individual phones? Do they have PoE? You know, do they have any power over Ethernet devices on the network? What type of cabling are they running? All right. 
Um, also considerations, very, various industries may require VLAN, uh, a separate VLAN, so medical, uh, financial, sometimes law firms, something where they're in a high secure environment, you need to maybe need to set up separate uh, VLANs for doing this. Maintenance may be more with an add-on cost. You know, so the, you know, if you upgrade their network, you know, there may be additional maintenance along with that, which could be a, a source of revenue for you guys, okay? Could they lower their phone bill? Absolutely, absolutely. But their upfront costs may be a little higher depending on, on their network, all right? So uh, some typical voice over IP add-on sales, uh, the email integration license, which we already talked about, where you can have your messages uh, or the user can have their voicemail messages emailed out to them. Uh, the SL2100 NUC desktop utility, which is computer telephony integration. Um, the third party SIP station license, uh, which is important for adding soft phones, um, the mobile apps for for smart devices, and also for uh, third-party conference room speaker phones. More often than not, um, these conference room speaker phones are now uh, voice over IP. They either have them as analog devices and voice over IP devices. Um, either way, they're real simple to add on to uh, into the system using the third-party substation license. And then we also have contact center, which is used in conjunction with ACD. And then we have the SL2100 in control software, which is a call reporting software where administrators can, can view their call, view and manage their call traffic, I should say. All right, so those are some typical add-on sales to uh, voice over IP. So from the what, why, and how segment, you know, make the determination. What type of voice over IP are they looking for? Or how do they feel they need voice over IP? Or how can, do they feel voice over IP can most benefit from it? Why do they feel they need voice over IP? All right, and again, how can they benefit most from utilizing voice over IP? Um, some considerations. Network infrastructure, uh, network maintenance, network bandwidth. See the common denominator here? The network. The network is very important to the success of doing voice over IP. All right? Um, when I was, years ago when I was putting this presentation together for voice over IP, I asked one of our NTAC agents, who is now our product manager for this product, by the way, um, you know, what, you know, what message do I need to talk about? And he, and he said, you know, for every hour that you do put in ahead of the sale to do things like analyzing the network and, and figuring out bandwidth and all that, that's going to save you about four hours of, of troubleshooting on the back end. All right, so doing a network analysis is very important um, to the success of voice over IP, and that does not happen a lot out in in the field. I know because I hear I hear from from dealers out there that are going in and replacing hosted solutions because the hosted solution isn't performing up to expectations, and nine times out of ten, the reason being is because of the network. All right, so any type of voice over IP, you've got to take a look at the network. And, and we're going to show you some things that you can do to help with that. And then don't forget the add-ons, because with voice over IP, there's opportunity for add-on sale. All right, any questions so far? While I take a sip of water. All right, let's talk about the benefits of SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, which is kind of the de facto standard. Uh, the benefits uh, of, 
uh, of SIP is, you know, now your voice and data can use the same network equipment. That is a benefit, even though I, I, I just gave you some warnings, all right? It can or, or, or allows for optimum utilization of bandwidth for delivering both voice and data on the same connection, all right? Bandwidths are getting higher, all right? So a lot of this bandwidth consideration that we had to worry about four or five years ago uh, is becoming less and less of a concern. You still need to pay attention to it, but IP providers are, are providing a lot greater bandwidth, all right? Reduce the need for copper lines, all right? So now you're not running two sets of, of wires to the workstation. All right? Can you have reduced or, or uh, toll or long distance surges? Absolutely, absolutely. You can do things like least call routing, and as I said, um, long distance charges from the SIP service providers are coming down. They're still minuscule. They're still charging, but it is minuscule. All right. And then you're beginning the integration of all communication devices: voice, data, and video. Right, onto one network, all right? Whoops, that was not the, the key I wanted to hit. This is the key I wanted to hit. What is SIP? SIP is an IETF standard. Um, IETF governs uh, uh, the standardization of protocols uh, like TCP slash IP. All right, SIP protocol is designed to run independent of the transport layer, so I believe it runs in between level layer three or four, uh, layers three and four on your OSI model. All right, it can run on the TCP, UDP, or SCTP protocol. One word of caution, even though SIP is, is a standard, it is a loosely held standard, which means everybody does SIP a little bit differently. So we, we show you that, you know, it's a TCP, UDP, or SCTP protocols, you may have to do some programming uh, under those protocols or make some adjustments under those protocols for your SIP service, right? But we have, you know, the tech support can help you with that, and we have all kinds of documentation up on the NTEC website that talks about this, all right? The benefits of, of SIP with the NEC, especially the SL2100, it being a hybrid solution. The 2100 allows for the ability to use POTS, PRI, and SIP trunks, either independently or in conjunction with one another. So it is not unusual that people bring in a couple of POTS lines, bring in some SIP trunks for long distance, you know, and then there's least call routing on the system. So based on the number that is dialed, you can program it, program it, I should say, that based on the number that is dialed, it'll choose which line that call should go out on. If it's a long distance call, it'll be routed to a SIP trunk. If it's a local call, it'll be routed to a POTS line if it's available, okay? By the same token, the 2100 allows for the ability to use digital SIP, uh, digital extensions, SIP extensions, and single line telephones. Again, either independently or in conjunction with one another, all right? And it does so, you're, you're now maintaining all of the features and functionality of the phone system because there's still a box on premise, a, a what we used to call a KSU, on premise, you're still maintaining all of the features and functionality of a phone system, even if you're using it as a pure IP solution. I mean, one of the fun stories that used to be told is, is you know, big hospitals investing thousands of dollars on a uh, uh, on a on a system. Do you want to change it? No, I don't want to change it. There we go. Uh, a lot of the, the 
you, you know, they spend thousands of dollars on a Cisco voice over IP solution, and then the hospital administrator sits down and says, all right, how do I make a page? And they're like, uh, you need to make a page. So a lot of times voice over IP and hosted don't play well with external paging systems. With a hybrid solution, even if you're using the, the SL2100 as a pure voice over IP solution, you're still maintaining all the features and functionalities of the phone system. And again, because we're a hybrid solution, all devices will be able, to, will have access to SIP trunks. So even if you're bringing in a SIP, you're bringing in SIP trunks into an SL2100, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to run all voice over IP phones. Digital phones, even analog phones, will have access to SIP trunks on the SL2100. And it goes the other way. I mean, if you're using voice over IP telephones on the system, that does not necessarily mean you need to have SIP trunks coming into the system. Voice over IP extensions will have access to POTS lines. Voice over IP extensions will have access to PRI service. So that's the beauty of, of having a hybrid solution or the SL2100 being a hybrid solution. You can do mixed media like that. Whereas with a hosted solution, you have to bring in SIP trunks and you have to use voice over IP telephones. All right? We try to make it easy to program both voice over IP extensions and SIP trunks, make it easy to adjust the codecs compression, decompression for bandwidth set, setting, and we'll talk about that later on in the presentation. All right, and voice over IP does make it easier for Mac work. All right, uh, um, as I mentioned with, with voice over IP telephones, you just unplug it, you unplug the phone from one location and you can plug it into another location and all the programming will remain with the device because when we do voice over IP, programming stays with the device. TDM programming stays with the port, all right? Now, integrating SIP or voice over IP on the, on the SL2100, relatively simple. There's not a lot of components to it, all right? Before we talk about the individual components of voice over IP, I do want to point out there are more voice over IP channels available on the SL2100. We have a total of 128 voice over IP resources available to the system. All right? Now, they're not all there. Um, at the beginning, you have to add licenses to get to 128 resources but you have the ability to have up to 128 resources, which is four times the amount that what we've had in our previous systems, right? So with that, you can then run up to 112 SIP stations or voice over IP stations and up to 64 SIP trunks. And you can do that all on one chassis, right? So that's what I was talking about earlier. Sometimes it may make more sense to expand the system via voice over IP. The cost will actually be less, especially if they have a very robust network that you're connecting to, All right? And with the 128 resources, you can do this up to 64 trunks, SIP trunks, and up to 112 stations all together because these resources are dynamically allocated as they need them including for SIP trunks. You're no longer having to assign a SIP resource to a SIP trunk. All of our SIP resources are dynamically allocated. So if the system needs them, it will assign them, all right? So as a result, you can lower your monthly bills. The, the end user can lower the monthly phone bills, sometimes as much as 70%. I'm not sure about that figure, but I'll run with it, all right? You could reduce the overhead because you're done in a single box. You're doing this all in a single box connection, all right? Greater flexibility, and you can start running virtual numbers and things like that. So there's a lot of benefits to doing voice over IP and the SL2100. Now, 
How how do we integrate voice over IP in the 2100? It's already integrated, all right? Out of the box, the SL2100 CPU has eight voice over IP ports built into it, all right? And that's standard. Now those voice over IP ports are strictly for voice over IP extensions. If you need to make those voice over IP ports for SIP trunks, you have to add a SIP trunk license. Now that SIP trunk license though is $25 your cost per SIP trunk. So if they need to add six SIP trunks, it's an extra $150 your cost for the six SIP trunk licenses, all right? So it's built in, it comes out of the voice over IP, or I'm sorry, it comes out of the ethernet port that's built into the system. Now, if you need to expand beyond the eight voice over IP ports that are built into the system, we have our voice over IP daughter board. Voice over IP daughter board resides on top of the CPU and provides an additional eight voice over IP ports on the system. All right, so once you install your voice over IP daughter board, your voice over IP daughter board ethernet port now becomes the active ethernet port and you now have 16 voice over IP resources in the system. From there, it is expandable to 128 voice over IP ports in 16 port increments or 16 resource increments. We sell a 16 port or 16 resource voice over IP license, okay? What, are our, what is our voice over IP resources support? They will support voice over IP telephones, our SL2100 voice over IP telephones. They'll support SIP trunks. They will support third-party SIP stations. They will support the networking of multiple locations, and they will support the uh, ST500 smartphone app. Now, these last four bullet points do require an additional license, right? But those, in many cases, those licenses are real inexpensive. Uh, we talked about the SIP trunk license is $25 per third-party SIP station license is $30 per user, your cost, and in multiple locations, uh, the SLNet license uh, is $50 for your first eight ports of SLNet, right? So the, these additional licenses are not that expensive, all right? Now this slide just shows how you can ultimately get to 128 channels. You start off on the CPU with eight voice over IP resources built in. Then you add your voice over IP daughter board to get to 16 resources. To get to 32 resources, you have your CPU with your voice over IP daughter board and a 16 channel license. And ultimately, if you have the CPU with the voice over IP daughter board with seven of the 16 channel licenses, you will get to 128 resources on the system. All right, so that's how you build out the system for, for voice over IP. Here is our voice over IP telephone. Our voice over IP telephone has uh, uh, four uh, menu buttons, four soft keys on it, and then it has eight programmable buttons up here. Now these eight programmable buttons are really 32 programmable buttons because you have a scroll key here. So you have four pages uh, of labeling here. And you notice this is a Desiless phone, all right? So the LCD display is your Desi label, all right? This phone is a full duplex speaker phone. The display is backlit. All right, the other cool part about this phone is it is a gigabit device. So you can put this, it will pass through the gigabit signal. So you would plug the phone into the network and then attach a, 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 a CPU, um, a, yeah, a, a computer to this device, all right? And it will pass the gigabit signal. So this is a gigabit switch. All right, this phone. Here's another 
example, kind of showing your front facing view, uh, showing the speaker and hold buttons, and then our four pre-programmed feature keys, which is flash, transfer, mute, and do not disturb. And then what's your menu key down here uh, does. It helps you navigate through the menu up here. All right. Your cost on the voice over IP phone, $160. All right. So it's not that expensive for a gigabit voice over IP device. All right. This slide illustrates networking. Um, you can network multiple locations on the SL2100. In fact, you know, theoretically, you can network up to 50 sites. Um, theoretically, it's not very realistic because we are still limited to a total number of 256 ports on the network. So your number of lines and number of stations on the network cannot exceed 256 ports. So while 50 sites may not be realistic, 10, 15, 20 sites may be, you know, depending on the size of the systems. Right? When you network solutions together, you can transfer calls, you can share lines, you can make intercom calls across the network, you can have centralized trunks, you can have centralized voicemail, right? you can have BLF indications and centralized park, uh, call park orbits. So I can answer a call at location A, park it, and intercom somebody at location D saying, hey, I got a call parked for you on this park orbit. Or I could pick up a call at location A, and if I have a, a, a DSS lamp on my phone for somebody at, you know, for a, a primary person at location D, I can see if they're on the phone or not and transfer the call across the network, All right? Having a managed network between the locations, though, is vital in order to the, to the success of this. And we'll talk more about that in an upcoming slide. SLNet, as I told, supports a maximum of up to 50 nodes with a maximum of 256 ports. So that makes the 50 nodes kind of unrealistic, all right? You can integrate an SL2100 with an existing SL1100. At that time, at that point, then your uh, uh, parameters for the SL1100 become the least common denominator. On the SL1100, you can do up to five locations. So you can add up to four additional locations. So on the, you can integrate the 2100 with the 1100, but then the, the, uh, uh, the limitations of the 1100 become the least common denominator, all right? Now the big one, Inter integrating voice over IP onto the existing network, all right? And this is where we're gonna talk about things like network requirements and, and, and things like that. Voice over IP in SIP is only going to be as good as the network that it resides upon. All right, so you need to make sure there's enough bandwidth there to support both the voice and data demands. You know, you need to see if the routers support quality of service. Quality of service routers prioritize packets, right? They kind of act as a traffic cop. And what they do is they prevent collisions of, of, of packets, All right? Um, Firewall settings becomes a big hindrance of doing voice over IP. So they, you know, the, the end user needs to punch a hole in their firewall, All right? These other two bullet points uh, are not as primary uh, anymore. You know, they, a lot of times the internet service provider and uh, um, the SIP trunk service provider are different people, so sometimes that handshake isn't as clean as we'd like it, um, but that's really kind of changing, uh, and there's really less and less of these type of the issues between them having a separate ISP and a separate SIP provider, all right? 
But the big thing, the big takeaway on this slide is the voice over IP is only going to be as good as the network that it's running at. So, what are the requirements for the network? And uh, these are more guidelines necessarily. Uh, well, I guess some of them are requirements. But one thing to understand that, again, the voice quality of voice over IP depends on, on variables like bandwidth, latency, quality of service initiatives, all of which are controlled by the network and or the internet service provider and not the SL2100. All right, so we do not do any quality of service initiatives on the SL2100. All right, therefore, NEC recommends connecting the SL2100 through, through a fully managed data network with quality of service implemented. Now, before I talk about some of these uh, requirements, I also want everybody to understand that we will support NAT traversal on voice over IP. All right, so you have to look at, again, this goes back to looking at how the end user is going to be utilizing voice over IP, right? Are they gonna need voice over IP because the business owner wants two voice over IP phones, one in their home office and then one in their vacation home in Tucson, Arizona, all right? If that's the case, do you need to run those voice over IP telephones through full, a fully managed network? Probably not. You could probably set it up with just simple routers and do NAT traversal back and forth. Depends on how much they're going to use that phone. If it's just going to be used as a hot phone, when somebody at the you know at the main facility needs to talk to an owner, the owner about something, it probably can get by with NAT traversal. All right, so you have to look at how they are going to use their system. You know, are they setting up a voice over IP solution with 24 voice over IP stations and a couple of remote locations? Yeah, then you need, you need the managed network for that, all right? So for a network to be suitable for voice over IP, it must pass the following requirements. Again, I'm a telephony guy. So some of this is, is kind of foreign to me, but one way RTP delay must not exceed 150 milliseconds. Packet loss must not exceed 1%. Data switches must be manageable. So if they have data switches on the network, they need to be manageable because you need to be able to assign IP addresses to the phone devices, right? No half duplex equipment can be anywhere within the network. Okay, routers must provide QoS. Routers should provide QoS, okay? It depends, again, you know, I go back to the example I just cited. You know, do if, if the business owner has a couple of remote phones in their offices, home offices, do you need to set them up with routers with QoS? Probably not, okay? And adequate bandwidth must be available for the estimated voice over IP traffic, all right? Well, how do we know what the, what the bandwidth is? Or what, how do we estimate the bandwidth? Here's the SL2100 bandwidth consumption. You see you, there, we have our different codecs here, all right? And with the packet size and the bandwidth used. Now, by default, we run the G.711 codec at a 30 millisecond packet frame. So each voice over IP call uses 79.5 kilobits per second. Okay, and then you see the different bandwidth requirements for the different codecs. So how do we apply this in our application? Well, now I'm gonna go back to my sixth grade Mac math class, and we're going to do an old-fashioned story problem, all right? Now, before I pop this next slide on the screen, there's gonna be a big asterisk here, all right? This next slide and the subsequent slides that I'm gonna show you were written by engineering, and they were written about five or six years ago. 
So the bandwidth examples that we're going to show you in the upcoming slides are kind of antiquated and outdated. So please, nobody laugh. All right, but I keep them this way. I keep these slides, quite frankly, because the math is easy. All right, so you know, understand what I'm going to show you. Um, you know, is from you know four or five years ago, but the math is the same, and the concepts are all the same. I just use this next slide or these next couple of slides because the math is easy. So here's what we're talking about with the bandwidth consumption exam example. Customer has a DSL connection, which provides five megabits downstream and 512 kilobits upstream. All right, told you this was an old example. All right, and, and when you talk to your end users about bandwidth, they're going to say, don't worry, we have plenty of bandwidth and then they will cite a figure for bandwidth. That figure usually that they cite is for downloading. That's their download speed. We're not concerned with download speed when we talk about voice over IP. We're concerned with the upstream speed, okay? So that's the, the, the number we need to focus on. So in this case, it's the 512 kilobits per second of upstream bandwidth that they have. So if they use the default setting of the G.711 codec at the 30 millisecond packet frame, at that point only six calls can be made. Anything over those six calls, you'll start to see choppy speech and calls may even drop. And understand in this example, that's the best case scenario because we're not taking into consideration the bandwidth required for data. So if they're using data, it may be only three or four calls may be made depending on how, you know, how much bandwidth is being used by data. Here's how we come to that. Upstream bandwidth allows for 512 kilobits per second. Okay, G.711 codec at the 30 millisecond packet size uses 79.5 kilobits per second. Six calls, times 79.5 kilobits equals 477 kilobits per second. If you would add that seventh call, it takes you to a total of 556 kilobits per second, which is over that 512K limit, which gives you choppy speech and may even drop calls. All right, sounds dire, sounds desperate. Oh my God, they don't have enough bandwidth. But now the question is, becomes, well, maybe they only have four lines coming in, all right? They only have four lines coming into their phone system. Only four voice over IP phones are gonna be engaged simultaneously anyway. So now this becomes not so dire, all right? Uh, you know, not, that's why I say you have to look and see how, they, how they're using the system. Now, if the system has 12 lines and 24 extensions on it, yeah, then that 512 kilobits per second is going to be a hindrance. That bandwidth is going to be a hindrance when doing voice over IP. So they have a couple of choices. How do we, you know, what do we do now? One way is to purchase more bandwidth from their provider. More bandwidth, more money, all right? Or you can adjust the codec, okay? If the customer would like to make more, more than six calls without purchasing more bandwidth, you can change the system to use the G.729 codec. Still at the 30 millisecond packet frame, but now you're using 23.5 kilobits per second. Under this codec, you, you, you have 23.5 kilobits per second per call, 21 calls times 23.5, 493 kilobits per second. All right, so you're still under the threshold. All right, however, this note up here, when you start 
playing around with the compression of the call, it can affect the call quality. I should say it will affect the quality of the call. Sometimes it's perceptible, sometimes it's imperceptible. So you have to set the bar with your, with your end user, All right? If you're going to, you know, if you're going to adjust the codec, it's going to check, uh, uh, affect the call quality. Your calls may st start to sound a little more tinny or, or hollow, right? Or a lot of people say it just sounds like you're being on a cell phone, all right? So, but you have to set the bar. If you don't tell, you know, if you don't tell your end user that if you adjust the compression, it's, you know, it, it's going to affect the call quality. If you don't tell them, they're going to be all up in arms. If you warn them ahead of time, then they go, all right, let's see what happens. All right? So you got to, if you're going to play around with the Kodak and the compression of the call, you got to, you got to set the bar with the end user. All right. Good news is is the applications where you're looking at 512 kilobits upstream for a bandwidth on a network are becoming fewer and farther between. All right. Even the upstream bandwidth is becoming higher and higher moving forward. So you need to, you know, in order to calculate bandwidth, whether they have the proper amount of bandwidth, you need to see how much upstream bandwidth they have on the network and do your calculations like I just showed you. All right? So summarizing, you know, again, the SL2100 is a converged network. We can run analog, digital, voice over IP trunks. We can run analog, digital, voice over IP telephones. All right, from a telephony standpoint, you know, there's eight voice over IP resources built into the system. From there, you would add your voice over IP daughter board and the appropriate resource licenses. We just have one flavor of voice over IP telephone. And then we have our SLNet software for networking. All right, and when looking at the network, you need to look at the network infrastructure in terms of the hardware on the network infrastructure as well as the bandwidth that they have on their network and then do your calculations accordingly. All right? From a support standpoint, NTAC is available to you guys. If you have not registered at NTAC, please do so. Go to www.necntac.com and register, registration is free. There you will get access to all of our technical documentation, all of our training videos, as well as our certification training. Certification is not a requirement, it is recommended though. Also, a couple of other pieces of software you need to become familiar with, Wireshark. Wireshark is a free software utility for troubleshooting networks. You can get it from wireshark.org. All right, when you call up NTAC and for troubleshooting on a voice over IP application, they are going to ask you for two things. They're going to ask you for a copy of the programming database on the system, and they're going to ask for a Wireshark report from the areas where you're having trouble. Maybe it's a couple of specific extensions. Right? They're going to ask for those two things. So download Wireshark, become familiar with it, become familiar with how to use it. And um, because again, NTAC relies on that heavily when helping you troubleshoot uh, voice over IP application. And then Boson Utilities. Boson Utilities is a calculation tool for calculating a network. So it'll look, see how many IP addresses are available. It'll do a subnet, IP subnet calculation, wildcard wild card, uh, uh, mask checker and things like that, all right? And it's, a both, it's available from boson.com uh, backslash free utilities, all right? That's another uh, good utility for you to use when doing voice over IP. 
There is our account manager map. Uh, you see I cover the Midwest here. And then we have Gordon Chamberlain in the Northeast, Terry Simon in the Southeast, Lennon Jones, who is uh, relatively new to uh, uh, NEC. Uh, he's been on board with us for a couple of months, but he covers kind of the South Central United States. Then we got Scott Wackett covering California and the Southwest states. And then uh, poor Jeff Johnson uh, covers the Pacific Northwest as well as the Plain states. So he, amongst all of us, is the one who logs the most frequent flyer miles. All right, there's our tech support number, uh, inside sales. Uh, and sales support, they're important because as you see, we all have a lot of territory we cover. Uh, we can be moving targets, so they are resources for you as well for getting questions answered on the 2100. All right. With that, hey, I came in at just about an hour. Um, I'd like to open it up. Is there any questions out there? Do y'all have questions about what we talked about? Questions? Questions going once? Twice? All right, again, you will be getting a, uh, a, a follow-up email with this presentation and links to the recording of this presentation that you can either download or stream. Um, so be looking for that in the next day or two. Uh, and then if you have any questions moving forward, you know, I would refer to you to, to the account manager in your area. I thank you all for taking the time today to attend. Um, go out and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.